I hope everybody is warm. We're going to dive into a bunch of questions today. Uh, some of the questions are actually around some common topics, uh, which is typical to see. And so we'll, you know, we'll take a look uh, at those groups of questions together uh, because they're common challenges that come up a lot. So we'll get to those. But first, uh, we'll start in with a couple of questions. The, uh, and then we're going to move into something special. We're going to have a little uh, funeral here in a couple moments. But first, the first question uh, so this person actually asked three questions. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer them all uh, together. Uh, so the first question was, what, what's on your post-its? So I'm assuming those are the, the post-its back there. Uh, there are a bunch of different things. They are, uh, some are reminders for me. Uh, some are reminders for other people. Uh, when I'm working on a book, uh, the, the book layout is up there behind me so I can check in each day on what I'm working on and what I need to work on next and really uh, it, it really helps to maintain the focus on you know why I'm making the book and what it's for uh, and then some of them are kind of uh, there simply to remind us of the value of getting ideas out of our head and making them tangible right get that stuff out there make it visible and then you can start to play around with it uh, the next question was what's the best way to break out of ruminating uh, my most recent video up on the Everybody Has a Brain YouTube channel, so you can find it at youtube.com slash everybody has a brain, is on that topic. So how to stop ruminating about intrusive thoughts. Uh, so I'd say check that out, because uh, there I go uh, quite in depth on that topic. Recommended reading choice was this person's other question. Uh, so somebody was already asking about the mind workout. I mean, uh, I guess my recommended reading choice would be the mind workout uh, by Mark Freeman. The uh, so next question. Now this this is where we gotta we're gonna have a, a kind of a little special event here. Okay, so here I'll read the question, and then we'll get into our special event. Okay, so, question is: OCD has ruined my life for a very very long time. I'm on the road to recovery. However, I tend to slip into intense anger and resentment often because of the years I feel I've wasted. I know that these emotions are toxic to recovery. How can I just make peace with the lost years and adopt a positive attitude? How do I just move on? Like you always say, leave the battlefield. How the heck do I do that? So uh, this will this will come up a lot. And this, uh, in many ways, uh, our experience with mental illness is like an abusive relationship. Where for many years, you wanna, whenever you try to leave the relationship, uh, the mental illness makes your life miserable. But if, if you go back to the relationship, and you're like, okay, I'm going to try and make this work somehow, again, your life uh, becomes miserable. Uh, and it's really terrible. And this just goes on for years, and you miss out on, on so much uh, stuck in this abusive relationship. You know, sometimes convinced that, oh, like this relationship gives you stuff you need. Right? Oh, no, the, the mental illness is watching out for my safety. It's watching out for the safety of my loved ones. Uh, but really, it's just keeping you in a cage. It, we really develop Stockholm Syndrome with that abuser, convinced that we can't leave, that we wouldn't know how to leave. Uh, and so when we're finally leaving, uh, then sometimes we can get very resentful uh, and angry and you know really want to get payback for all they took from us. The problem is, then you're still putting that mental illness at the center of your life. It's still in charge then. And so it's so useful to walk away. Now, uh, sometimes we may want to find closure. We want to find peace. Uh, that can pose its own set of challenges. Right? Because sometimes we end up approaching that uh, the same way we approach other feelings that we wanted to chase when we were stuck deep in the mental illness. The, you know, wanting to find peace can end up being the same as wanting to find calm, wanting to find safety, right? And of course, we did all sorts of different compulsions around that, and that perpetuated the mental illness. So, uh, so to um, the uh, person who asked about moving on today, we're going to have a funeral uh, for mental illness. So you can move on. Right, so we're going to have this funeral, you know, I, I've prepared a little uh, eulogy uh, to mental illness here, uh, which I'll read. So 
gather in, everybody come to the funeral for mental illness, we'll light some candles, imagine mental illness kind of uh, spread out in a coffin there in front of us, uh, and now we're going to bury this bastard. Get uh, Dear mental illness, you have taken so much from me. I thought you were watching out for me, but all you ever did was take from me. So I've come to your funeral today to say some things to you in the hope that I might find peace and closure. Oh, forget that. Mental illness, you've already taken too much of my time. I'm not wasting any more time on you. You, oh, you just suck everything out of life. Fuck you, mental illness. And then uh, we can just walk away. The uh, challenge... I find with uh, trying to go and get peace and closure out of mental illness uh, is that, uh, again, it's just, it just becomes this new barrier to living our lives. It, it, it just takes us away uh, from building that healthy life that we actually want to live, from doing the things that we actually care about. And if we just keep coming back to find that closure, it's never going to give it to us. Exactly. Yeah. Rest in peace is mental illness. Stay dead. And that's the thing. Like we've, We've got it, you know, it's, it's dead if we want to walk away from it. But so much of that is growing that other thing, right? So if we want mental illness to stay dead, we have to be putting our energy into mental health. And we're really thinking about what are the things you want to grow? Right? What are those seeds you want to grow in your life? And, and we, we just, we kind of have to walk away from it because it's never going to give us closure. Right? It really is this, this, this terrible codependent relationship. Right? And it'll, it'll promise. Like mental, mental illness will be like, no, no, come back. Like this time it'll be different. And I, like, I'll, I'll make it up to you. And because if we hold on to that desire to kind of get payback, that'll trick us in every time. And that's, that's, something, that's something to watch out for. Because when we're struggling with mental illness, we get very transactional. Uh, where we want, you know, something's taken away, we want payback. Right? We don't want to get ripped off. That, that's often one of our fears. And so if we feel like we've been ripped off, we want something to compensate for it. We want somebody to pay for it. And, but again, if we, if we want to get that payback, uh, we're, we're putting that mental illness at the center of everything. And it's really still in charge. Even if we think we're getting payback, it is in charge. It is going to suck up our life, all of the energy that we could be putting into other things. And, is, and so it, it's, it's really difficult. Uh, but I think the thing to start to notice is that, you know, you kind of have this monster over here, this mental illness monster that's going to want to keep pulling you back to really understand what it is you want to grow, right? Where do you really want to be going and, and move towards that? And it, it's going to feel, uh, it's going to feel so strange at first because everything in your body is going to be saying, no, no, you have to go back and you have to solve mental illness. Uh, and then we just get stuck in it. Yeah. So I know it, 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 can, it can seem, I think often we're told, you know, go find closure, go make peace. Uh, but sometimes you can just walk away. You, you can just walk away and, and, and put your time and energy into the things you want in your life. Uh, because mental illness has taken enough. Right? And now you know how to swim. Right? So you don't have to go back to shout uh, at, at, you know, that the water because it, it tried to drown you once, right? You, you, you don't have to live around drowning, right? You can live around swimming, uh, but that does require us to like really invest in swimming. Okay. Yeah. So thanks. Uh, thanks for coming, uh, to the funeral today for mental illness. Uh, and thanks for not staying at it. The uh, next question, uh, having experienced harm thoughts and recovered from them, do you still watch scary or violent movies at the risk of exposing, exposing your subconscious to more of these images? Uh, yes. Uh, before when I struggled uh, with, with uh, my mental health, I, yeah, I wouldn't watch. I wouldn't watch all sorts of different things, uh, all sorts of different scary things. There were all sorts of like news stories or articles I also wouldn't watch. And uh, so, you know, getting over mental health challenges, um, 
you know, definitely means like I, 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 I need to be able to go and watch those things now. Uh, like if I, if I come across them, if, if I was still avoiding them, uh, then I couldn't really say that, uh, to me, I wouldn't say that I'm in recovery or that I've gotten over the mental illness. Cause that, that would be like saying, uh, I don't have a problem with drowning. I just avoid water. Okay. The, uh, I really see recovery as the ability to experience, uh, anything inside or outside of your head, well being yourself. Uh, and so that includes, uh, things that could be scary. Uh, next up. So the next question is, how do you effectively break down your mental health condition to someone who has absolutely no idea what you're going through? And so I think it's, it's important to consider how this actually connects back to uh, the idea of moving on from mental illness uh, and, and just in what recovery can mean. So when it comes to talking about mental health, I don't suggest putting the emphasis on uh, explaining the mental illness uh, because these are things that we can overcome. Right? These are things we can move on from. Uh, and so there is, there is the potential there. It's kind of like going up to somebody and to use the, the, the swimming analogy or metaphor, uh, like going up to somebody and say, oh, I'm a, I'm a drowner. And like you, you really need to understand what it means to be a drowner. Uh, like we can learn how to swim and it's, you know, if, if we're going up to somebody who swims and we're explaining why we can't swim, it is going to be very difficult for them to understand, uh, what that means. Uh, but if we want to learn how to swim, uh, there's a great person to connect with and talk about the things we do want to learn. So that's something I find that, that one thing I'd really emphasize, like going where, you know, towards the things, the skills that you want in your life. And so if, you know, if you're at work uh, or it's in a relationship, being able to talk about the things you're working on and the things that you're, the skills that you're building, because other people can support you in that. If you tell somebody, I want to learn how to swim, I need your help learning how to swim, and here are the things you can do to help me learn how to swim, that person can do something for you now. But if you just go up to them and say, well, I, I, I drown when I'm in water uh, and I'm a drowner. Uh, so I, I can't get in the water. Like there's nothing for them to really do. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind here uh, is that everybody has a brain. Uh, they are going through their own challenges. They may not have the exact same challenges as you, but it would be extremely weird if they had perfect mental health. Right? That's, that's pretty unusual. Everybody's dealing with challenges. Uh, also, that person, they may be dealing with, you know, who knows, even more severe challenges than you, and they may just not see it as having anything to do with mental health. Like when, when, I, when I was really struggling, uh, I did not see myself as struggling. Uh, and, and for years, I, I saw no problem with what I was doing. Right? I, I wanted to prevent spreading deadly diseases. I wanted to, you know, keep the apartment building from burning down. I wanted to avoid the evil people that were watching me every day. Uh, I didn't see myself as having a mental illness. I never would have considered myself as having mental health problems. The reality was I was, I was really, really deep in, in uh, mental illness. And so there's always that to keep in mind too, uh, that when you're sharing about mental health, it's very likely the other person may, you know, may think they have no issues. Uh, but when we share about what we're actually going through and what we're working on, often people can realize how they can connect with you. Uh, and it, I would say in general, so doing this kind of work all the time, everybody has mental health issues. It's, it, no one ever comes up to me after an event and says, whoa, I have no idea what you were talking about. That's so weird. Right? Ev everybody is going to be able to understand something and connect with you in some way if you present it in that way. But if you present it as, oh, I'm so weird and I have this weird thing you can't understand, yeah, then, then you know, people are not going to be able to connect with you on that. Uh, so there is that element of kind of understanding uh, and empathy towards others, too. Just going to check. I saw some questions popping up here over on Instagram. How to stop thinking that compulsions are the right way to do things, even if it's time and mind-consuming for you and the ones around you? Something that I, and this is really common, uh, and so I talked about this in the mind workout. Often, 
when we're struggling with mental illness and we're engaging in the compulsions, we don't actually see the consequences as connected to the compulsions, right? We think, like you're saying there, we think that uh, doing these compulsions are the right way to do things. So I describe it in the book as being like when somebody who likes jumping in the water but hates getting wet. And so the step to make is to start to recognize that those are connected. You can't jump in the water and not get wet. And so if you hate getting wet, you kind of have to hate jumping in the water. And, and so that'll probably require some work like to just really recognize, like if you don't like the consequences that these compulsions are having on your health, on your time, and on the people around you, then do you really want to keep liking them? Like, is it worth it? Right? Are there other things that you'd rather put your time and energy into in life? Okay. Uh, I see another question here from Daryl. Uh, I've been suffering with uh, depersonalization and derealization for four months. How can I stop checking myself in the mirror if I'm real or not? Uh, so this is actually uh, really good, Daryl, that you recognize that it's the checking. Right? So depersonalization, derealization, for people that aren't familiar with them, uh, they are the experience of not believing uh, that you are real uh, or not feeling real or not feeling like yourself uh, and, you know, maybe questioning the existence of the world around you or questioning your own existence or like Daryl was saying, like the, we get caught up in all sorts of compulsions then around checking to make sure you're you. Like I used to do it with pictures. So I would have to look at pictures and check to see if it was really me and then the more I checked, of course, I, I, the less I believed it was me until I wasn't convinced that pictures uh, were actually me. The key with depersonalization, derealization is to recognize they're a natural consequence of checking compulsions. So if you're always checking to make sure things feel real, if you're always checking to make sure that experiences are you know, the right ones or that they're real or whatever it is you're trying to be certain about, uh, your brain will very naturally level up to increasingly complex and severe uncertainties that you can't solve. Eventually, always getting to something like, am I even real? And so the way to start to tackle this is to, to go back and start to cut out the much smaller checking compulsions. Uh, so really start to see deep, the, the depersonalization, derealization. They're a natural practice. Right? That we just keep practicing until we have those experiences. Right? It's kind of like exercising and then you experience sweat. If you do checking compulsions, Eventually, you get to depersonalization and derealization. Uh, so really, you know, if, if you're finding it difficult to cut out the mirror checking, find other checking compulsions and start there first. Uh, everyone, get ready for this. This is, uh, so there's two questions here about contamination. Uh, but get the tissues ready, because uh, this really gets at uh, why, uh, why we want to work on getting over this stuff. So uh, I'll read you the first question. So this is, I have issues with contamination that I've really been struggling with, uh, like hand washing, thinking foods are contaminated, uh, clothes, etc. What advice do you have for this? Uh, and then uh, another viewer uh, answered or kind of left a comment as well. And they said, same as above. My daughter has suddenly realized she won't be able to open presents or touch anything that has bought, been bought for her. As it's all unclean to her and that just all oh, hits you right in the feels like there uh, like if there's any any you know any comment that it, it really just captures the impact of engaging in, in, in mental illness compulsions right uh, a young girl not being able to open Christmas presents because you know it's gotten to the point now where she sees them as contaminated and so again, this kind of, we could even connect this back to what I was just talking about there on depersonalization, derealization. The, the more we practice compulsions, very naturally, it will always keep leveling up. It will always take more and more. Because in a sense, we really think of it as a practice. Uh, and so like any practice, you'll just get better and better at it. Of course, better means we put more time into it and it eats up more of our life. And it just becomes more automatic. And, and that's why it's so important to stop these things before they get incredibly severe. We have to stop these things before we're not able to open Christmas presents. The, so then the work, 
I mean, when because often we don't realize there's a problem until it gets to that point, uh, is to, again, start with cutting out uh, compulsions related to contamination around things that are going to be a bit easier, uh, and then progressively work up to those more difficult ones. Uh, and so that's a great opportunity to, to work with a professional. Because uh, it really is, it is like, just like physical fitness. Someone can lay out a program for you, uh, and essentially what you're doing, each time you use something you believe is contaminated, that's like weightlifting. So you're saying, okay, uh, I know I struggle with lifting these things, lifting this feeling that things are contaminated, so I'm progressively going to work on this. And I'm going to start, though, with something very small. Right? So using something I believe is contaminated uh, that doesn't cause me as much anxiety. Uh, and in those, as you're doing something like that, you get that opportunity to look at the fears that are underlying that. Because it's likely, uh, and not just likely, it's kind of guaranteed, I'd say that the fear of contamination is actually about something else. So it could be, I'm afraid of touching something contaminated because, uh, and there's quite a wide range here, but it'll probably have something to do with identity or death uh, or other people. So some people uh, might be afraid of touching something contaminated because they're afraid it's going to change them. And if I get that contamination on me, I'll become a bad person. Or if I get that contamination on me, I might spread it to somebody else and they'll get killed by it. And so there's that fear there of, of hurting somebody. Uh, you know, or that previous one, like losing their identity. Or they may be afraid uh, that they'll get something on them that could kill them. And so that's the other piece of this, really going after that underlying fear. Because if it's about something like death, then there's a lot of work there to be done on death. It's not just about, I have to convince myself it's okay to be contaminated. Right? Because there's like a much deeper, uh, bigger fear there. Okay. Um, I'm just going to check here on Instagram, see what we got here. Okay, Gabby has a question. Hey, any advice for someone getting freaked out by being mindful? It's almost like my brain freaks out when I haven't been worrying. Actually, pull apart two things here, right? Because there's the practice of uh, mindfulness, being present, uh, practicing non-judgment, being aware of what's going on around. Um, and then there's that other aspect that you brought up there that you, the brain freaks out uh, when I haven't been worrying. Uh, and this, this is how you really start to see how we built our lives around solving anxiety. Uh, and this goes all the way back to what we were talking about there, walking away from the battlefield, you know, really having a funeral for anxiety or mental illness, but like not showing up to the funeral, right? You don't have to spend any more time on this. There's a thing that kind of happens here. So again, talking about a practice. So from years of practicing mental illness, we've become very good at it. And then we decide, okay, I'm going to start to cut out the mental illness. So we start to reduce the compulsion. So you can look at it it's kind of like this downward trajectory, right? We're not going to do the compulsions anymore, right? And so our anxiety practice, mental illness practice goes down and down and down. We have to have an opposite practice, a place that, like I was talking about before, the place where we want to go. Uh, you could look at that as your enjoyment practice. And that's, that's going to help in these moments because what happens is, so we cut out the compulsions. I'm like, okay, I'm not going to do compulsions anymore. But for years, that was the only way we knew how to be happy. All we, all we knew how to be happy, uh, the only way we knew how to be happy was by solving anxiety. And then we're like, oh, okay, I got rid of the anxiety. Or I got rid of the thoughts. Or I, I did the thing that the mental illness wanted me to do. And now it's done. And now I can feel good and I'm free. And then, of course, because that's what made us feel good, then the brain is like, okay, well, here's another uncertainty. Here's another intrusive thought. Right? Whatever. And then, then we have to go and then we have to solve that. So we're making this big shift from fueling our life with fear to fueling our life with values, the things we care about. Right? And those are the things we're going to go towards now. Uh, we really have to be building that. So in those moments when you're like, okay, I've, I've stopped the compulsions, uh, now what? You need that thing to go towards. Because if you don't have that thing to go towards, uh, your brain will just give you a thing to react to and, and you won't like it. And, uh, and so then the other thing when we're practicing mindfulness um, is to just notice um, that it's, it's okay to be mindful of fear. Right? It's okay to soak in fear. 
Uh, it's okay to be really anxious. It's okay to have all sorts of uncomfortable feelings. Because what happens is we think like, oh, it's being mindful means I have to be, have some kind of weird, pure mental state uh, that's totally clear. And that, that's just not, you know, what your brain is going to do. Right? If your brain wants to throw up a bunch of anxiety right now, it's going to do that. Just like if you, I don't know, if you ate something weird for lunch and your stomach, you want to meditate and your stomach wants to throw up a whole bunch of weird stuff. Like it, it, that doesn't have to ruin your, your mindfulness or your meditation practice. You can be present with those feelings. They're in many ways just uh, indigestion. Whether it's like indigestion in your stomach, indigestion in your brain. Uh, and you can be present with that. And so part of it's starting to get comfortable with that. Uh, and, and that takes its own practice. Because for so long, we've always wanted to control those uncomfortable feelings. And we kind of seize up and we want to get rid of them. And we think having them means things are wrong. And so by practice, being mindful and accepting them and making space for them starts to show your brain it's okay to have those feelings. Right? You can have those feelings and you can do really important things. Right? So that's something you can really teach your brain. Yeah, let's hop over to another question that came in before. Um, and actually, this is kind of related to, because uh, we're going to talk a bit about values here. Okay, I am having a tough time with values. The thing I value the most is keeping my family safe. My compulsions almost always revolve around this. I tried using the five wise exercise. It doesn't seem to be about any fears related to myself. I simply can't bear the thought of them suffering. Any advice would be greatly appreciated. Uh, so actually uh, go right back to that question and look at this statement. It doesn't seem to be about any fears related to myself. I simply can't bear the thought of them suffering. That, that's the fear related to yourself right there. It's so often uh, when we're struggling with mental illness, we think we're doing things because of other people. But actually, it's we don't want to have those feelings. Right? So that we don't want to feel guilty about hurting somebody. Right? We, we don't want to feel uh, loss. It, we're, so often, we're just trying to get stuff. Right? And it affects uh, the people around us. It affects us. Uh, so something to think about with values is that, uh, so what I always say, don't make values a compulsion. Okay, so compulsions are about trying to control and avoid fear. And so you probably, uh, and I wouldn't just say probably, I, if you make your value, I want to keep my family safe, expect your brain to just obsess about all the ways they could get hurt. Because that's basically what you're telling your brain. Uh, I, like, I want to protect these people from harm. Then your brain is very helpfully going to be like, okay, I will think of all the ways that they could be harmed. Here you go. And it'll just go for it. And so it's so important when you're looking at values. And again, this is about not building our lives around fear. It's, it's about building our lives proactively around values, the things we want to create and build and put out into the world. So when you're looking at values, what is it you want to create? Because avoiding bad things is not the same as creating good things. So really, really keep that in mind with values. Uh, because, yeah, I mean, if you want to keep your family safe, I mean, lock them in the basement and never let them go anywhere. Hey, now that, that may not actually keep them very safe. Uh, that, that would probably cause a lot of problems. But the, you see the point there, right? Because you could limit your life. You say, oh, we can't do that because a bad thing happened. We can't do that because this bad thing might happen. You may prevent all the bad things in the world. And you can. this applies to your life too, you like our own personal lives. Because often we think, oh, I, I don't want that bad thing to happen, or I want to avoid that illness, or I don't want to get hurt in that relationship. You can do all that. Uh, that's, that's what mental illness is all about. Just sh locking yourself in a cage that you're convinced is protecting you, and you don't realize the bars of that cage are just trapping you. So when it comes to values, look at how do you, how do you create a healthy, happy life for your family. And you know what? Sometimes that's going to involve taking risks. Uh, and this is where you trust yourself. And you build skills. And you say, look, I, I understand that this is what's going to be best for my family. Uh, there are some uncertainties around this. So I'm going to go and handle those. Right? What, what skills can I bring into my life to better support my family? Right? How, what uncertainties am I going to recognize? Let's say, look, okay, there's a fear over there. But I am too busy putting my time and energy over here into building something better. 
right? So we don't have to keep fighting mental illness, right? What's the, that healthy life you're going to build? Right? You can walk away from mental illness. The um, Oh, and Gabby, I just saw you talking more about what we were just talking about there. Uh, you mentioned uh, it's like my brain is going through withdrawal from thoughts. And again, that's, a, that's exactly it. Our brains, what we're doing, we're basically getting ourselves hooked on solving problems. And so, and again, like I was just talking about there with safety, if you, you want to be safe. And so you get hooked on trying to be safe. What you're actually doing is requiring your brain to give you all these fears or to give you all the intrusive thoughts. That's what it does there. And so, yeah, it's, it's totally an addiction, right? We get addicted to solving problems. So then we always need problems, right? If we, if we only measure success by defeating enemies, we have to have enemies. Uh, and that's why it's so important to walk off the battlefield. So the question, is the goal of mindfulness to be present in the moment without thinking? For example, when I'm cooking, I'm only thinking about cooking, but my mind can still be thinking fast about the next cooking task. Yeah, the, um, you could be like a, saying like mindfulness, you're, you're really being present with whatever you're experiencing. Now, the thing I'd watch out for, though, is if you're only going to be aware of thinking. And so you're not taking maybe a moment to kind of say, oh, okay, thoughts, actually, I'm going to really pay attention now to the smell or the taste of the food. Or I'm really going to notice this spoon in my hand. And so in terms of building mindfulness skills, just be aware that it, it's really helpful to be able to move around all of your different senses. Right? So... Uh, you can you can absolutely be be mindful of the thoughts in your head, uh, and so just what I'd say there is: can you also be mindful of your other senses? Because uh, if that's really challenging right now, to say just be mindful of smell, or just be mindful of taste, or texture, uh, if that's really challenging, then that can be something useful to work on while you're cooking, because uh, you probably thought about food enough. Uh, next question. How to let go of compulsions related to the idea of spirits punishing you, like religious OCD, but about the supernatural. Uh, this, uh, so, again, it's always useful. Whatever the topic that's bothering us the most, take a step back and look at ways you've been engaging in the same pattern in other areas. Because uh, so, really what we get into uh, when we believe we're going to get punished there is actually, again, that, so there's two things I'd say. There's that transactional pattern of thinking right? that goes all the way back to what we were talking about there with the funeral. Right? If you think something owes you something. Uh, so because what's going on there, we, if we believe things owe us something. So in one way, if we think, oh, if I do this good thing, like other people, like good things will happen to me. Or if I do this good thing, then the universe is going to uh, like reward me somehow. If we're doing things like that, then it's very natural to also do the flip side to worry that, oh, if I do bad things, then also supernatural beings will harm me, right? And so those go together. Uh, so one, look for that, right? Because if you're doing transactional things in one area, very natural to come out in another area. Uh, the other thing is just, just to look at the magical thinking thought patterns that go on there, right? That, that our actions control these things that are disconnected from us. Uh, so similar to the transactional aspect, again. Uh, but... You know, are you doing other things in other areas where you, th you think you can control things that you don't actually control? Because uh, those might be the areas where you want to tackle the compulsions first. Uh, and then you'll, you'll you know, develop the skills to handle those fears in other areas to really say, oh, okay, uh, yeah, these spirits, they're going to punish me. Uh, and, oh, I want them to punish me. They're going to do all sorts of horrible things to me. And so I'm going to really live my life. I'm going to pour myself into my life and build the most amazing life for the spirits to destroy. And so always uh, the antidote to so many of these things is to live your life and just really push uh, into living your life more and doing all the things you want to do. Because uh, that, that really shows your brain, hey, I can trust this person. This person's not afraid of spirits messing these up because this person trusts themselves to handle it. Okay. The, uh, so there were a couple questions that came in uh, beforehand on the fear of not getting better. In some ways, we've been talking about that. Uh, so I'm going to cover a couple of them here. Uh, so the first one, I'm on the fast track at squashing my compulsions, but I have a major one that I need help with. It's checking. 
I'm constantly checking in my mind to see if the OCD is still there or if the OCD will be there. What is the best technique to squash this mental compulsion? So one thing uh, to watch out for is that if you want to get rid of OCD, uh, your brain is going to keep worrying about OCD. And right, that's the enemy you need. Again, if, if, you, if you measure success by defeating enemies, you, you've got to have the enemy in your life. So if your goal is to be OCD, uh, you're going to have OCD. If you, so this is where you really want to think about, again, what is that enjoyment practice? Right? What's the thing you're going to walk away from and build? Because that's the thing you can be focusing on. You can really say, oh, okay, so if OCD is there, whatever. That's fine. If it comes, if it's not, if it, like I don't really care about that, am I putting time and energy into the things I care about? And because those are the things that you, you know, that's how you want to live your life. And so you really want to bump down the importance of OCD. But part of that is actually not getting caught up in liking that you're beating it. And so even, so on that question, like at the beginning, you know, it started out saying, I'm on the fast track at squashing my compulsions. That's, that's great. You know, we, it's useful to be cutting out the compulsions, but we're doing that because we want to put our time and energy into other things. And so even in things like that, we want to start to measure, like, am I doing those other things? Because it doesn't, at the end of the day, I mean, you, whether you, you cut out all the compulsions or not, again, like you could cut out all the compulsions. It doesn't mean you've actually done something in life that you care about. It doesn't mean you've done something that you want to do. Uh, and that's the danger when we get caught up in fighting OCD or fighting any mental illness. We just put all of our time and energy into it. It's just a way that the mental illness tricks us into, into staying at the center of our lives. It's right, it's right back into the abusive relationship. Right? Even at the funeral, right? it wants us to come and like find closure. Again, it just makes it itself at the center of our lives. And you, you got to like cut it out of the center. Right? It is, boom, not there anymore. Okay? Uh, and... There were the, another question related to that was how did you get over the fear that you wouldn't get better? I think it's so important to approach this the same as any other fear. It, the, and, and so you can use the same techniques, like the same kind of techniques we would use with anything. Like, you know, so if it was contamination, you know, then it's really about, you know, using the contaminated thing while you do something important. You know, telling your brain, yeah, I, I want this. You know, I want to spread this contamination to everybody important in my life. I, you know, it's going to destroy everything I've ever wanted. Like, that's awesome. I Like, oh, I can't wait to get this contamination over on everything. And then you use it and, and you, you know, you do the things you care about. You show your brain you're not afraid of that. Uh, and so the same with the fear of not getting over OCD, not getting over any mental illness. Because, right? again, it's a way it tries to hook us and keep us wrapped up in it. Right? Just doing things to try to control and manage that fear. Uh, and so again, the, what you want to do, he was talking there earlier about the antidote to any of these fears really to live your life. Do that here too. Right? Grow things. Because so often when people are worrying about that fear, you know, like what if it came back, where it pops up is actually when we're about to do something really important in our lives. So we're about to get into something important. Say it's a relationship. Right? Say you really, you know, you, you really care about other people. And you really want to be like be building a healthy relationship, and so you meet somebody and you're you know the relationship's starting to get serious. You start to worry. Oh no, what if the OCD comes back? Because uh, then it's really going to mess up the relationship. This is the thing I've always wanted. Oh no, I don't want that. So maybe I should put the relationship on hold right now until I can be sure the OCD. Like I'm really done with the OCD, and then I'll get back into the relationship. Right? But you see, like it 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 just it just took you away from it. Right? And so you thinking you were going to take time away from the thing you cared about to solve the problem is the problem, right? The moment you do that, it's already won, right? It took you away from doing the thing you care about in life. So just be aware of that. Like do all of the things you really care about. Do them huge. You can trust yourself to handle it if it pops up because you have the skills to handle that, right? It's like learning how to swim. Right? You, you know how to swim now, so you don't have to be afraid of the water. Um, uh, so I just see there was a follow-up here uh, from Daryl when we were talking about uh, checking mirrors earlier. Uh, so he just says, so if my brain told me to check the mirror, then don't check it. Yes. So I related, I had other reflection uh, checking compulsions. This is an awesome way, and I would say this out to anybody, 
uh, because you often don't realize that you have checking compulsions in mirrors and reflective surfaces uh, or, you know, trying to check uh, if other people are looking at you, right? We have all these checking compulsions. Really notice the pull and you'll feel it, right? You'll be walking by a mirror and your brain will just be like, oh, you've got to look and just feel it. For me, I was it was always very physical. I would physically feel my body was very upset that I was not taking the time to go and, you know, look at this reflection and check it. Uh, so notice that. And again, carry on with the thing, something else you really care about. Uh, and, and I call it making your brain squirm, like really make your brain squirm when it is desperate for you to check. Oh, don't check, like purposely look in the opposite direction. Uh, and then your brain will learn that, Hey, you're in charge. Um, uh, here's a question. Uh, was, I was wondering how to keep mindfulness, ERP and awareness into my everyday life in order for it to become a habit. The, the thing to look at with all of these comes back to like, how, what do you want to put your time and energy into? Um, and then, but also when it comes to mindfulness, I think it was so useful for me to recognize that mindfulness isn't this thing we tack on life. It's not an extra thing we have to do. Uh, it's actually the practice of being. All of this other stuff is all of the stuff that we've tacked on. It's something we have to practice. Uh, because we've become so used to attaching all of this other stuff on. But it's, it's, it really is your, your way of being. You, you don't have to add it on to your life. It's more about uh, learning, how to, to, learning how not to do those other habits. That's what it's really about. And so that's the practice. You can say, actually, I don't want to go and be uh, caught up in all of this other stuff right now. I just want to be here. Pop over here to a previous question that came in, uh, same kind of uh, topic as that fear of not getting over. So the question was, uh, sometimes I'm absolutely amazing. Yes, you are. And oh, also, and I'm on top of my OCD. Uh, recently, I feel it slipping again and I find myself with this sickening confusion and pain. Do you have any tips for working through such strong feelings and thoughts? I wanna believe they are not real, but when I'm in the midst of the strong, painful feelings, I'm so lost. Um, so the, I'd go after that idea of trying to work through them. Again, it ends up being like, oh, I need to find peace with this, or I need to get this feeling. Uh, what I find so useful is to soak in them. And I think uh, when we're working on this stuff, uh, say something like panic attacks. When struggling with panic attacks, often we feel like, oh, I don't like that feeling, I need to get rid of it. And we have that flinch. We start to feel those you know, feelings or their thoughts, physical sensations, whatever it is that we don't like, and we immediately kind of pull back and we want to control that. Right? We want to get over it. We want to solve it. Uh, it can be so helpful to start to just feel it. Like let it, so I was describing this to somebody the other day. Uh, when I used to struggle with things like panic attacks, like I would feel it, I'd kind of feel it in my chest. It would kind of, everything would tighten up. And what I would want to do uh, is keep it from spreading. And remember it was very conscious because uh, if I was going full-blown panic attack, I would feel it out to the tips of my fingers. Right? My, it would kind of start here in the chest and it would just go out to everything. And so I, I just wanted to like prevent that from happening. And I thought that was very bad. And so it was really useful to learn actually when that feeling was com coming up to actually not try to slam it down, to actually want it to go all the way out right? and to really want to soak in it. And, and so it, it can really help to look at how can you have those feelings as opposed to kind of how can I get rid of those feelings and how can I solve them? Uh, because that, uh, that judging of the feelings, saying, oh, these are you know, strong feelings I don't want, that's the problem. If we don't want to have a feeling, then we're going to keep having that feeling uh, and we're going to keep struggling with it. Someone asked, you talk about the bigger underlying uh, fear beneath the compulsion, but once you found that fear, what do you do with it? The reason for doing that is to notice the commonalities between all the different compulsions. So for example, like I mentioned earlier, somebody with a con uh, contamination fear, they might actually be worried about other people hating them for you know spreading diseases and killing people and things like that. Right? So that fear is actually about what other people think about them. So once that person recognizes that, they can look throughout their life, oh, what are the other things I do because of the fear of people hating me. And they'll 
they're going to see all sorts of other ways they practice that. It's likely that those other ways that they practice that, uh, in many ways, will be very, I mean, not nearly as severe. Right? So somebody who's afraid of people judging them, they probably do all sorts of things around emails that probably to them don't seem like that big of a deal. Like just checking emails and rereading emails and rewriting them to make sure they didn't make a mistake at work because they don't want people at work to be upset with them. That's the same compulsion. Right? The contamination compulsion is the exact same as the rereading and checking emails. It's the same fear. If they're really stressed by the contamination compulsion, they're probably going to find it easier to cut out the rereading uh, and checking email compulsion first. Right? And so that's, that's where that exercise is so helpful. It shows you other, other places where you can start uh, working on the same fear. And so it's the thing. And so when you're cutting out any compulsion, then you, you want to take it all the way to that fear. Because uh, it's, you know, it's not just about the contamination. It's I'm going to spread this contamination and everybody is going to hate me. Uh, I'm going to be alone for the rest of my life and nobody will like me right? because I, I spread that contamination to them. Right? That's how you start to get at that, that fear. Because it's not just, oh, no, I might, I might spread some contamination to somebody. Right? The, um, there were a couple of questions this week. This, this is actually a topic that I haven't seen come up that much. Uh, but it's really useful to look at. We just had a couple questions of this week, which is so it's great to dive into it. It's kind of a, it, it's related to working on recovery, uh, but connected to mania. So I'll read some of the questions here. I was diagnosed with bipolar mania, but it was OCD. And whenever I get happy, I think I have mania. I just can't get this off my mind. I know I never had mania and I was misdiagnosed, but the OCD throws this thought at my every happy moment and kills it. I recovered from OCD in the past, but due to this misdiagnosis, I relapsed. Now it's hard to believe what's right and what's wrong. I even doubt the tools that helped me recover. Okay. Uh, and then, so that was one question. I'm going to answer them both together. Here's another question. When you were getting better, did you ever feel a little manic? I sometimes do. It's like I'm improving and my mind doesn't want me to, or is not used to pleasant feelings and throws me doubts. And so it's, it's great, I would say to both of you who asked that question, it's great you recognize this. Uh, and it's so important to remember to anybody out there, uh, mental illness isn't only about uh, feelings you don't, like, you know, feelings, say like a feeling like anxiety. So often, uh, and you, you see this a lot uh, on OCD forums, people will say, oh, like, I'm not feeling anxious anymore, but I still have all of these OCD problems. Uh, and that's totally normal. The uh, OCD isn't necessarily about anxiety. Right? So much of mental health is just how we react to feelings, right? how we handle uncertainty, how we handle emotions. And so it's really useful, I find, to look at recovery as the practice of being yourself while experiencing any thought or emotion or any kind of stuff around you or inside of you. You could look at it that way. So that's going to mean uh, that when you're working on your mental health uh, and, you know, kind of moving to, in a direction you want to go, uh, that you're going to continue in that direction, right? Continue in that enjoyment practice. Continue being yourself and doing things you care about regardless of the stuff that pops up because often that stuff will be stuff you like. It's going to feel like things you like. Uh, it, it can also, again, feel like things that make you uncomfortable, uh, and what you see in both of these questions, though, too, is, again, that fear of not getting better. Right? So there's that fear, oh, no, if I'm, if I'm happy and I enjoy this, then the mental illness is come, going to come back. Uh, and so then it becomes an uncertainty and a fear. We react to it, and the mental illness is back. Uh, so there's two elements to this. So one, like we've been talking about there, uh, you, know, you, you want to be able to accept that fear of not getting better, like any other fear, uh, and continue to do the things you value. Because right? it's just a way that the mental illness is going to try to stick around. But the other thing is actually, you know, being able to learn how to have uh, feelings you really enjoy. Again, while doing the things you value. Okay? So you can have those feelings, right? and your brain can be like, oh no, you're enjoying this too much. You can say, oh, that's, that's fine. Like, I can have that feeling of too much enjoyment because I know that I'm going to keep on doing the things I really care about. I'm going to keep on putting my time and energy into those things I really value. And that, that keep coming back to that practice. You can have absolutely any feeling and you can trust yourself to be yourself. 
Uh, I just see over on Instagram. Uh, yes, uh, someone just said uh, the brain can be so crazy. Uh, that is absolutely true. The brain is nuts. Uh, here is a question. Yo, Susie just asked, I have a really close friend and lately I've been experiencing intense feelings of annoyance. She's not doing anything negative. She's a great friend. Uh, what should I do? Uh, so again, uh, always useful to explore. I mean, is there, you know, when we're feeling annoyed, uh, why are we struggling to have that feeling? Uh, and then, yeah, yeah, I always come back to that, that practice of, you know, what we want to put our time and energy into. So if you want to put your time and energy into that relationship, uh, then what are the actions you can take to do that? Uh, if you don't want to put your time and energy into that relationship, uh, what else do you want to do? And then that's, that's the thing you can do. Somebody else on Instagram asked here, earlier you mentioned that when we move in the direction of change, our brains will tell us to turn back. How do we know that this desire to turn back isn't a sign that the change is wrong? Oh, this, you're oh, so many brains are gonna hop on this. Uh, the, um, I, I liken it to uh, trek through the wilderness. Right? So we're going out into this wilderness of life. And nobody's, oh, there's only 30 seconds left. Nobody has been out in this wilderness before. Uh, and so what we get to do is we get to take steps. And we get to take a step and look where we are. And then we get to, again, choose which direction we want to go in. Uh, and the brain is always going to be upset and trying to trip us up. Uh, and so it's really important to understand your values because they'll be your compass. All right, so I know Instagram is going to turn off here in two seconds. Thank you, everybody over on Instagram. There were some questions that I did not get to yet uh, that came in earlier. Uh, and maybe this is a good one uh, to cap things off with. Uh, and so what do you do when, and so in this case, it was, what do you do when your OC migrates? But it could be anybody dealing with any mental illness could run into this. Right? It could be like, what do you do uh, when your mental health, you know, topics, themes, whatever, your anxieties, uh, your fears uh, migrate? And it's so important to recognize that they don't. Right? Superficially, it can seem like they do. But this goes back to what I was talking about earlier. Right? The, you know, the person afraid of contamination uh, and the person, you know, that, that person that's also checking their emails compulsively, that's the same fear, right? They're doing both of those things because they're afraid of what people will think about them, how they'll be judged by other people. Right? They're afraid of things interfering in their relationships with other people. It's so useful to recognize uh, those underlying patterns uh, because otherwise it seems like it'll keep moving and it'll keep doing that as long as you go after the superficial topic it'll keep moving like if that person the more afraid of the contamination if they don't dig under and start to work on their fears of being judged by other people their brain will just keep coming up with new ways they could be judged even if they got over the contamination and they haven't tackled that fear of being judged that fear of being alone being disliked by others uh, the brain will just come up with a new way that they could be judged or disliked by others, right? And so we, we have to go after those underlying fears. Uh, we have to recognize those common patterns. Okay, so thank you, everybody. Uh, you know, we'll do one of these again soon. Uh, it's holiday season, so I hope you're taking care of your mental health. Uh, you know, when you're thinking about the new year, awesome thing you can do for yourself this year is just uh, be kind to yourself. All right, thank you.